Hey everybody, On the Run with Beards and Dunn are back for another episode and we've got our, one of our best friends in the world to be a guest with us, uh, Bill Winmark. And uh, I'm not even going to attempt to read Bill's resume, but I'm going to post it. In fact, I'll use it kind of as a promo for our podcast. You really want to read this guy's resume to see what he's done in his life because it, it'll, it always makes me feel like inferior but that's okay <laughs> that's okay bills yeah yeah dick and i together's resume doesn't add up to a page of, of bills but uh bill winmark is uh it's just a unique unique character and dick and i even though we call ourselves the dunley twins because we're our birthdays are a day apart but also a year apart but you know people tell us we're very similar and lots of mannerisms and what have you and hopefully that's a good thing bill's kind of been our big brother and he called himself our big brother. And I love that because he really has, Bill's a little bit older than Dick and I. And he's kind of like the brother who came along. And then here come these two twin boys. <laughs> and he had to help raise them. He basically had to help raise these guys. And despite his best efforts, well, it didn't always that, Well, and that's he why he doesn't to. have any hair left on his head anymore. <laughs> Well, he did coach. He did coach Dick for a period of time. That's and, a and whole he did podcast have in itself. <laughs> yeah, it did. Well, let's like, get into this. You know, I'm going to try to do a brief little introduction for Bill, and and then we'll just kind of get into some fun discussions. But you know, Bill is, you know, I think uh, commendably, and thank you for your service, Bill, was a Navy corpsman in Vietnam, and and for us, like Dick and I, I was too young for Vietnam, and maybe that was a blessing, um, not to have to even you know consider the ramifications of being involved in that. Well. Bill was definitely involved in that up to his neck and then some. He was working with the Marines in Vietnam, and, and some of the stories he has are, are chilling, but also very um, inspiring, and, 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 and we can learn a lot. He then you know, came back and, and created a, a, just an amazing career and life for himself. You know, I think in a nutshell, business-wise, Bill, uh, you, know, you were the president and CEO of Now Medical, which was, now I don't know if it was the first uh, now care, if it was the first acute care center in the state of Minnesota or the twin city area. First, yeah. The, yeah. The first urgent, urgent care, care. Yeah. you know, now they're, the I drive down the road. The I see them everywhere because I think the, the medical mm -hmm. community has figured out, you know, go to where the people are or something like that and make this less. Anyway, it's, it's a, it, he was a entrepreneur and a visionary to kind of get that thing rolling. And then, um, you know, in his spare time, you know, he started ALARC, the American Lung Association Running Club in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And Bill's going to tell us about that because their goal was to help people, you know, and, and, and in a nutshell, what I'm trying to get to is Dick is a, and Dick can attest to this, Bill is as a service oriented person. I think if he can help anybody, he would, he'll give you the shirt off his back. He's helped. Yeah. I went out to Leadville to, to go out with, with some friends, Joe Stiller and I wanted to go to Leadville and I called Bill up cause he has a home there. He goes, you can just use my house. And, uh, there, there's Bill finishing Leadville for the 20 something time. But, um, you know, he, he didn't hesitate and, you know, money was never an issue. I think we paid for utilities or something like that is all we had to do. And his hot tub was fired up and ready to go. And so, uh, I've known Bill from, uh, for about, God, it's going to be 30 years. It was in the mid eighties. Dick and I did a running camp in the black Hills of South Dakota and, and Dick asked Bill if he'd swing by on his drive between Leadville and Minneapolis. Don't even ask me how far that is. But he stopped by our camp to do to help us do video analysis of the runners because Dick and I had no expertise in that. I had a video camera and Bill came and the campers loved him in, in Bill's expertise and, and knowledge. And then we were involved in the Dick Beardsley Marathon camps. I think, gosh, 12, 13, 14 yeah. of those things. And so Bill and Dick and I, I don't want to call us the three musketeers, but we've, we've got a bit of history and Dick and Bill more than I do. So with that being said, that's, that's my take on Bill Winmark. You know, we're going to get into his athleticism as well. You know, he's, he's going to talk about how he was a hockey player and then how the running, how running got into his, his DNA. I, well, we'll find that out. He's run over hundred marathons. He's a sub two fifty marathoner, um, Leadville 100, both the mountain bike and the run three time, I think Kona Ironman, uh, you know, and the list goes on and on and on two times. Sorry. I embellished. Well, that's my introduction. Did I'll let you do a little bit. Well, we'll I could go on and on too. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and we'll get into this. Cause at one point, um, after I blew up by Achilles tendon in 82 and then again in 1983, and I couldn't run for a couple of years and I, you know, so I missed out on any chance for the Olympics in 1984 in Los Angeles. So once I got back running again, I, I decided I wanted to see if I could 
you know, qualify and maybe try to make the 88 Olympic team. And so I, I got Bill involved with that, but and we'll get to that. But Bill, th- first off, again, thank you for uh, for joining us uh, today. But let's <laughs> let's first start about you know you grew up in a, a small community north of Minneapolis, Anoka, Minnesota, and uh, you became a pretty studly hockey player. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit yeah, about that. Good. Yeah, uh, yeah. W- that was in the early years uh, before we have the wonderful systems, the Bantam systems, the developmental systems that we have, Accelerate Hockey Minnesota, all of those things. We we just were kids that loved to play hockey. And, of course, uh, we were so close to the na- northern Canadian teams. Canadian hockey was where it was all at. And northern Minnesota sure. was where uh, hockey was hockey. We were down in, in, this, in the urban areas and we didn't know much about it, but we sure loved the game. And Joe Alley and Joe Poole were my coaches, our coaches. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be in that age group that they started the developmental program. I started skating on double blade uh, skates at three years old in Park Street in Anoka, Minnesota. My mom and dad had me out there. And so, you know, I've skate, been, probably been born with skates on my on my uh, feet. And we went through all the developmental programs and I, I was uh, very good at what I did playing with for the Noka Tornadoes and all conference, uh, um, you know, the state recognition uh, ended up just jumping way forward, um, ended up actually coming back from Vietnam and for a couple of years, uh, played semi-pro hockey uh, for a couple of years. Uh, we were nothing, but they wanted to beat <laughs> up on us. So the, the Vulcans and the and the junior stars, the real the real dudes, uh, they just used us to beat up on us. But yeah, hockey's been a been a wonderful part of my life, and and enjoyed it, and and I was pretty good at it. I was very big. I was six foot two and right. two hundred fifteen pound defenseman, so I was a pretty big boy, and, and probably knocked a few people well. around. Uh, I would not, imagine, Bill. <laughs> a little bit, and we saw we saw the advent. My my generation saw the advent of indoor arenas. Aldrich Arena was built during the time that we were we were progressing up uh, playing hockey. We always played outside, so we had to shovel the snow. Uh, from our ice rinks, we we were never playing on inside ice, or we knew nothing of a zamboni, whatever right. that butt was. Uh, we did did our own shoveling. The only thing I can remember that I appreciated a lot about the snow and the cold was that it stopped bleeding a lot faster <laughs> than it does indoors. Because right. <laughs> because all you do is go grab a snowball and put it on on the laceration <laughs> that I had many of them on my head. <laughs> from getting hit by pucks because I dropped down in front of the shot and took the shot. And uh, so, yeah, you, you had blood all over the ice rink. So, when, Bill, when do you have, are you missing any teeth from, you know, most hockey <laughs> players, gonna... when they smile, they got gaps in their <laughs> – you got any fake ones? Yeah, you see <laughs> – no, they're all good. They're all mine, and they're 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 all good, absolutely. And I was able to reproduce children, so I didn't get hit in the, in the wrong spots. So how did how did running so, how did know, running? Because we want to get into this. How did running come on the scene then for you? Well, it it just came on because uh, somewhat of a generational, somewhat of a uh, a transitional thing was going on during this time. That the, what you asked about, Mike, I'll tell you. The same thing was happening with marathon running. And Dick will know that when I, and we'll come back to the, the ALARC program. When I went to sell the idea of training, nobody accepted it because you didn't do that. You, Dick knows that. You guys got out of GBS. You guys would go for a run. That's how you trained. You just got a bunch of guys together and you went and ran and you ran hard and you trained and you did that. And in 1976, when the City of Lakes Marathon was created, that was four laps around Lake right. Harriet and Lake, Lake Calhoun. Um, that was uh, most of those people that ran would finish around three hours, you know, maybe a little over three hours, but you never saw anybody in those early years no. running four hours, five hours, six hours, not a chance. And I was just, you know, a, a pretty good athlete. And I said, you know, I see these guys going running and I love the lakes. And I said, you know what? I think I'll go down and I think I'll just go do the marathon because after all, I'm a <laughs> hockey player. I mean, come on, you can do this, right? I can do this. So I had my jock strap on and I had my 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 uh, cotton shorts on and I had my knee high uh, Vikings uh, socks on. And oh, 
They told me that it was really important to get the right kind of shoes. So I went to Target and got this leather, kind of semi-leather, uh, four-striped Adidas shoes with gum soles on them. They looked really good. I thought, well, that'd, that'd be good for the marathon. And I had my I had my University of Minnesota sweatshirt on, and, and I said, I'm good to go. And uh, and I ran the, the, the Twin City, well, in that time, the City of Lakes Marathon. Well, when I got to the finish line, there was a lady passing out ribbons for the 5K. And she said, congratulations, sir, you just finished fifth in the 5K. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, I just finished the marathon. Well, about three and a half hours before that, the marathon had ended and everybody was gone. <laughs> I ran 5 59 59 oh my goodness. Wow. 5 59 You 59. broke six hours. <laughs> six hours. I broke six hours. I thought this is a good start. And I remember looking at my Volkswagen Scirocco five speed across the parking lot. And I've told you guys this story. I believe it took me at least a week to get over to the car. <laughs> and then it and then I had to figure out how I'm not going to shift with my left foot because I'm not going to push the clutch in. I can't. My leg is not going to push the clutch in. It's lucky enough to be on the accelerator. And I got home and I don't know how I got out of the car. I don't remember that. But I remember, I don't remember anything for three days except the epiphany that said, there's got to be a better way to do that. That is amazing. Bill, I didn't, I kind of forgot that you went through that kind of turmoil, <laughs> pain and suffering, but your, your stubbornness just made you go, you know, there's probably some times out on the well, course, you know, with four laps or what multiple laps, you had some options to bail. Oh, I'm not going to do See, it. I, no, the marine in me, the hockey player in me. Go. No, no, you start something, you finish it. No, I love you, it. You, you just don't. Do I love that. it. And it, and and the the medical training, the physiology that I had had my residencies in pulmonary medicine, my residencies in anesthesia, my residencies in orthopedics, and my residencies in combat medicine, obviously uh, to go to Vietnam, you know, gave me the physiology that said I I experienced a lot of physiology. <laughs> For that right. those six hours, <laughs> yeah. you went through the whole yeah. gamut. Well, and, <laughs> and and Dick, well, and Dick knows way. Of, we're moving this way down the road. That same knowledge is what I, uh, I, I thought I could help yeah. Dick uh, at the time that he asked me to 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 participate with his desire to to return. So this, and so yeah. that medical that medical knowledge just gave me the indication there's there and and also educational thing. It's just to write a curriculum, which I did. And I took it to the uh, MDRA meeting. I remember that forever at Nokomis uh, at the community and we should center. Met, Bill, and, we should mention you know, the MDRA is the Minnesota Distance Running Association. Yeah, it, it, it's it's the the club of Minnesota for Minnesota distance running. And so, you know, Dick was involved with it. Gary Bjorkland was involved with it. Uh, you know, um, uh, Mike, Seaman. Mike, uh, what was Seaman. Mike's last name? He lives in Leadville. Now. Yeah. All the guys, all the guys, everybody and, and ladies who ran. And I presented one evening and I said, I've, I've got an idea, 14 week, because I wrote all the curriculum, what I believe would be necessary to do your first marathon, wrote it all out, all instructions, everything, and what the classes would be and uh, and presented it. And uh, and they said, you know, no, no, thanks. I'll, all I was asking for is about $300 to help start and have their endorsement. They said, you know, Bill, a great idea, but I don't, I don't think anybody's going to take a training class. And that's where I went over to, I was already on the board and, and, uh, re and eventually president of the American Lung Association. And uh, I asked Jerry Orr, the executive director, I said, Jerry, can you give me a classroom, one staff member and $300? And let's start, I, 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 let's start this marathon pro training program. And I, the first uh, class was 18. And then every class thereafter for 27 years was about 70 to 80 people, one for grandmas and one for Twin Cities. And we trained uh, uh, just short of 4,000 people to run their first marathon. And only three out of that, only three, didn't finish their first Amazing. attempt um, of a marathon. And Dick Dick became part of my faculty along with Janice Klecker was and Barney and a whole bunch of It was one of the most fun things running and speaking wise that I, 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 I so look forward to it 
every the twice a year and it was so much fun and 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 bill you, i i made such good friends with some of the people over the years oh. that you kept in contact oh, with they loved you it was, it was a ball <laughs> well so yeah i see so yeah. you took your experience and said okay that was rough i know there's a better way i'm figuring and you figured out a better way and you wanted to share it why should other Correct. people go through the try you know good a lot of people wouldn't have finished that first marathon after going through what you did just on pure will. And a lot of them may have given up the sport, given up the, the activity. and just said, yeah, I guess running's not for me. And you said, well, no, that's, there's a better way to do it. And I, I think I have it and I want to share it. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's important about a lot of things we do in life, and some of us are genuinely given those, those roles by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all glory goes to him. And and we're given these things, and if we'll just we'll just let things happen, you'll see them happen. And they may not always happen the way you think you think it should be going, but it does go the way he'd like to, you to use you. And and we make we make significant changes. And, and look at Dick now. There are four generations, uh, literally, of the students we had, their kids, their kids, <laughs> and their kids that have run the marathon and know you. They know me. And the tr and that has become a, a tradition. It would have never. We changed lives. We changed more than four thousand well, lives. And, we changed a lot of Bill, lives. And Bill, not better. only did you yeah. have this weekly class once you started, but then, you know, as you guys, as the groups got into their long runs, you were hosting at your home every Sunday. These you'd have 50 60 70 people there for a, a 20 yeah. mile training run you'd have all kinds of food you'd set out water stations i mean that in itself took an amount uh, an incredible amount of effort and then the one thing that everybody that ran the the twin cities marathon that started in 1982 you came up with the idea along with other folks um, that were helping i'm sure Tell us about uh, at the 20 mile mark of the Twin Cities Marathon that you and the ALAR group did. Yeah. Yeah. Jack Moran and so many other names that would be so familiar to, to each of us. You know, we were such a, a big club and we had so many runners that when it went from the City of Lakes Marathon to the uh, St. Paul Marathon, Steve Hogue was a part of that one yeah. time only. Then it became, uh, I believe, then the Minneapolis Marathon. And then all of us got together and said, let's make the Twin Cities Marathon. So it, it was ourselves and you, Dick, and so many people just had said, let's pull this all together. And they said, you know, to ask me, they said, you know, Bill, you are so experienced with your people. Why don't you take the most critical spot in a marathon known by, by its term, the wall, <laughs> and 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 be at the wall and be a more of an inspiration than a stopping point and so what we did uh, in cooperation we basically for 40 years uh were the uh, 20 mile wall which became uh, each year was something different newer better bigger better bigger <laughs> bit kept on building up to now the the thing this this huge balloon arch that we actually use still with our club for a lot of events to to basically add some some wonderful color to their events, we still use that wall, and that was the twenty mile wall, and uh, and and became famous. Uh, you know, Doc Bill was always there at the wall, and all my students and all the people who knew who we were, they couldn't wait to get to the wall. And then you only got six more six point two <laughs> more miles to go to St. Paul to the capital. Well, okay, so Bill, marathon. so you had so, the wall, then you decided to start something. You know, there's no marathons in the winter time. What could we do? maybe raise some money, get a tradition going. Tell us about the big plunge that you <laughs> folks do that you started and you haven't missed one in like, I don't know, a long time. Years. 35 years. Tell us about that, Bill, because it's crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it was just uh, um, uh, a, a gentleman had been hired. I was working for Governor Perfitch uh, with the, the development of the Braemar, or excuse me, not Braemar, um, the... Um, uh, training center. Oh, Blaine. Oh, I'm, I'm blocking on the yeah. Blaine, the Blaine Training Center. So we were in charge of the track and field development program. So we hired a coach from California, uh, the state of Minnesota did, to come in and be the head coach. And one of the things that he had sent to me, he said, hey, Bill, he said, listen, I, I, I'm i from Southern California. I grew up there. Every New Year's Day, I always go for a swim in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> 
And he said, now I'm in Minnesota and there's nothing liquid here on January 1st. It's all frozen. I said, no problem. I said, come on over to my house. I'll get a bunch of my buddies. So we we lived in Deep Haven just off Lake Minnetonka. We had to get a 10 mile run in. I said, okay, guys, let's go. And I, I, I had already found out where there was some open water by the docks over in YZ where they keep the big docks open. And I said, okay, guys, we're going to go over there. We're going to run. So we did a five mile run all the way across Lake Minnetonka. I said, okay, guys, take our clothes off. We're going to jump in the hole, jump back out, put our clothes back on, and we're going to finish the run. That started the run, and that's become my charity now for 35 years. We raise money every January 1st, uh, downtown Excelsior, right there at the community docks. And uh, it has been a great joy. We have partners with uh, now the Tunnels to Towers in um, New York, which is, of course, a post 9-11. That's a gentleman by the name of Steve uh, Sinner, I believe his last name is. His brother died in that as a firefighter. And what we've asked them to specifically do with the money we raise is we just built uh, the last two years, we helped build uh, two homes for two wounded warriors. One gentleman lost both his arms, one one arm, one leg. And so we built accommodated homes. So we raise money and that's my charity. And then we support our local law enforcement, fire, uh, suicide prevention, huge. We support that as well. So thank you, Dick, for mentioning the 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 ALARC charity ice dive. That's my baby. And, I, and those eight people that ran with me on that first time, they're all either passed or gone. I'm the only one remaining uh, for the, the dive. So yeah, that's 35 years that I start that ice and, dive. And no how, matter what the how, many, how many people? Eight. How many people do it yeah, on average? Yeah, we get anywhere from 400 to 800 people. Per year. Four to 800 people. It's a tradition. We've got the shark robe. When you get to to, uh, to 10 years of diving, you get this incredible black shark robe that's coveted, absolutely coveted. If you go 20 years, you get you become an orca. You get <laughs> the orca uh, robe. And then if you become only me, and I have one young lady who came to me when she was in high school. She went through high school, college, getting married, uh, having a family, and she dove every year, she will be the next, uh, in, in my case, I'm a polar bear. So if you've dove 30 years, you become a polar bear. She will be my polar bear. And I and I told Megan, I said, Megan, you know, I'm not going to be around a, a long time. I hope to be around a, a lot longer, a little bit longer. But I said, someday, somebody's going to have to step up and, and step in, and, and I'd like you to be that person. I'd like to have you keep my charity going when I'm not here because it's a really good thing that we're doing. So Megan is is stepping up each year to learn a little bit more and a little bit more and and someday she'll replace me because I won't well, be and Bill, and, anymore. You know the all of course all the local Twin City television stations come and cover it. But over the oh. years you guys have made national news, CNN, NBC. I mean it's it's a it's a big deal. And and tell me tell it me is. Bill, how it, many 400 to 800 per year, not total in 30 some years. Each no. year, and yeah. is there yeah. a minimum amount of money? I don't like bringing up the money, but it's a fundraiser. Do you say, like, if I said, hey, Bill, I want to come do it, you're going to go, great, Mike, you be here at this date, at this time, but also what, what kind of financial commitment do I have to commit to? Yeah, $25 is all that's you it? pay. Oh, and, let's and go. <laughs> that's it. And and we're we're rocking and rolling. We're, we're good to and, go. But people you know, do better. And, than, and all we have is And people like, do more than 25 I bet. Do some people? Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. for sure. Oh, yeah, we have in-kind donations that come in. Uh, just wanted to be part of it. Uh, some that don't dive anymore, but but absolutely. Beards, I'll give you the twenty-five they... bucks to go do it next year. <laughs> I know... will pay for Dick's. <laughs> I, I'm in North Carolina. I probably can't get there by January first. But Dick, you could be there in, in a few hours. I, I've done a few of these for charity things in Bemidji and Detroit Lakes over the years, and. I tell you, I, I have trouble dipping my big toe in a heated <laughs> swimming pool, let alone a, you know, I think cutting a big chunk of ice out of the lake. I think it's such it's, a cool yeah, event. Yeah. That is so cool. Is. And yes, and it is on the news. It makes the news yeah. all over. So that is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you know, and 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 that that also, I just have to say that that you know, we're talking about connected pieces here and how they tend to. To, to mutually and beneficially, you know, ride together. And, and so you just talked about the media coverage. There's generally not much going on on January 1st. Right. So in kind, we are, 
a big attraction. And it is a very incredible event to watch with all the screaming that goes on and other kinds of gestures and and kinds of things when people jump into a 36 long, eight foot wide trench and you got to go underneath the buoy line and get all the way <laughs> no to the cheating. other end to make it an official dive. But, but the messaging, the messaging is so important. The messaging for me is to tell the story of our wounded warriors, tell the story of these men and women who wear the American flag on their uniform. What I do here at school in, in, in basically keeping that rich history of our country alive that opportunity is there and these good things that can be done uh, because we hear plenty of, of the other stuff every single night right. and day. Let's talk about really what some people are really doing that make this place a better place to live. And, and so Bill, one do. last question on that. So on the dive and, and whatnot. Yeah. So you've been doing it 35 years. What's the coldest air temperature that you've ever had in the morning before everybody started jumping in that big old open <laughs> hole in the ice? <laughs> Absolutely. Well documented. My wonderful director of the events, Harley Feldman, keeps all of those statistics. We know exactly what year that was. Uh, that was 2016. It was 16 degrees below zero with a wonderful northwest wind blowing in at about 30 miles an hour, making the wind chill 30 some degrees. <laughs> below How many zero. people showed up? How and, many showed up? And uh, I, I don't remember because I just tried to remember <laughs> that I was still even alive on that one because... I, whatever whatever our hair I may have had instantly when we came it was the one area that we were diving in at the time uh, required us to climb up out of the out of a dock and uh, all I remember hitting that wind that's where I lost the last <laughs> part of my hair because it just froze instantly and then broke off and never came back again Let's... and and our our shorts oh, froze immediately. <laughs> You're lucky that's the only thing that didn't freeze. <laughs> well, that too, that, you know, now, now one of the things that I, I'll just tell you the story. One of the things that I do is I do a lot of commentary during this. And, and when we were over at the Bayside restaurant, it was a wonderful venue for this purpose. And a couple of my young students here at the high school came, some of the boys, and they had this canary yellow little G strings on. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, let me just pause for just a moment before these young men who I know personally from the high school, dive um moms and dads it, do you recognize any of these young men as dating your daughters right now i just want to assure you that we're going to see a very important part of physiology that goes along with cold water you see those little those little yellow sacks right there the, the banana sling yeah yeah yeah, yeah, just, yeah little yeah little little healthy bananas there you know well Watch, I, I, I'm just going to tell you, your daughters, I want to assure you, and, and I, I had the parents raise their hands. I said, okay, I see you up there. I said, I want to assure you that your daughters are safe until July because you, what you'll see in those little packages right there is going to disappear until July. Because those little guys are going to go out of here <laughs> right now, and they're going to climb up into a much warmer environment, right. and they're not going to be out let's, let's, for at let's least get this until back to July. PG. And then they'll jump in. <laughs> They'll jump in and they got out and I, I go, you guys are looking. You guys are looking. I know. <laughs> Bill, let's, let's back up the truck here. Do you, you know, I know you, I've heard about your mom and, you know, I always wonder what makes people oh. tick. And I got the joy and pleasure of meeting Dick's folks. And Dick got the pleasure of meeting my parents. Yeah. I, unfortunately, you know, I think I would have liked to have met your mother because I've heard a lot about her. Did you, do you have siblings but your mother's story, I think, is just so inspirational. And, and you know, because she was not an athlete, it didn't sound like, because in her generation, that wasn't something that girls, women participated in. But tell us about that. Yeah. Yeah, I do have my sister, Barbara. Mm. She's a, a year younger than I am. Uh, she went into the medical career following our mother as well. Um, my father was an industrial engineer at FMC doing Navy contracting work. Uh, but mom was our medical inspiration. And, and my sister, Barbara, uh, just retired from anesthesia after 35 some years uh, of, of work or more. But yeah, my mom, uh, when my father died, uh, he was 70 years old when he passed and uh, they were living in Gulf Shore, Alabama. And, you know, again, a transitional thing, spending your whole life with with a, a person like that. Uh, about three years after after she had sort of worked through all of that work, she said, you know, son, I'd like to move back to Minnesota. And so I went down, helped her. We moved her back up to, to Minnesota. 
And one day she just, uh, she just said, uh, cause she'd always been volunteering and helping out. She said, you know, I want to run a marathon and she was 72 <laughs> years old. And I said, Oh, mom, mom. And understand that my mom was a Yale graduate master's degree in psychiatric medicine. Uh, she started the first, uh, before women were even recognized in sports, she started the first, uh, Yale women's basketball team. Mom was tall, tall, very, very, very strong. She was a accomplished equestrian. Oh. Uh, so she did a lot of horse riding. So she, from that standpoint, but nothing personal ever on her own. And she said, you know, son, I'd like to run a first marathon. I said, mom, let's talk about this and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. And, and so she came, she came to the first class, long story made short. Uh, she not only finished her first marathon, all grandma's marathon, all grandma's marathon, uh, personal. She knows Scott and Scott knows Edie known by Edie, uh, my mom, uh, Scott knows her personally and loves her dearly. And so everybody knew Edie. She did her first marathon at grandma's and she did 10 grandma's marathons back to back until she was 84 years old. And then that last run, you know, when she was coming down the course, everybody knew that she had sort of announced that would be her last run. Everyone was turning out for Edie. And Dick, Dick, you and I know Scott very well. And Mike, oh, I know Scott, know Scott yeah. but Dick and I know Scott very well. We should mention well. Scott Keenan, who and, started uh, and was the race director at the Grandma's Marathon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dick. And uh, one of the uh, one of the things that we both know Scott to be very, very, <laughs> very fastidious about was nobody right. started early except Edie except Edie yeah. because he let her go because everybody in ALARC you know both our students who were the blue uniformed blue uniforms are first time runners so they had the blue ALARC jerseys on so you knew who our first timers were all of the experienced runners had the red That's uniforms right. on so they, they had to earn their red uniform you know, they had to earn it by finishing their first marathon. And our our every grandma's marathon when my mom was was in the marathon uh, was a great joy, sort of like we described earlier, the wall becoming right. a celebration instead of something bad. They couldn't wait to see where on the course they were going to pass Edie and see Edie. And so she did uh, ten, She did Bonnie Bell. She won her age class, obviously, because nobody else was out there uh, in the same case. But thank you for asking about my mom. Oh. She she uh, she made it to 97 years old. Wow. And, um, you know, it, and I think my mom, it, when you think about what I'm trying to do, too, is with it, which we'll, we may or may not get to. But I'm trying to do some things that nobody's ever done before. Mm -hmm. And I and I and I reflectively thank you for asking about mom. I reflectively think about my mom where I'm at at six, 76, going to be at 77 years old is my mom was still running marathons. My mom was still running marathons at 77 years. What am I thinking about? You know, I mean. Oh, hey, you do, you dude, do a few things old, okay. Mr. Bill. <laughs> We're going to get to that here in a minute. But let's, let's do jump yeah. into, yeah, but, go ahead. But, you know, she gave me the, she gave me the DNA. Right. I, I, I bless my mom. I bless my dad, a stubborn, wonderful, <laughs> tough nut from Boston and Boston. And, uh, you know, they give us these gifts and, and they manifest themselves over time. And uh, sometimes we sometimes the gifts aren't so good. But most of the time, you know what? It's a gift of love. The two of the fact that both of them got together and created my my sister and I. Right. Uh, what a wonderful gift to the world. Well, you yeah. know, kind of so, taking awesome. your career, you know, you, you got into running and marathoning, but then the Ironman, was that just a new event on the horizon that people were kind of enamored with and you saw it and said, Hey, I could do that. <laughs> what, what? Yeah. 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 I think, yeah, I think what interesting that thanks for asking that question, because what I'd done with my marathoning is, is when I'd run the marathon and 104 of them, I said, you know, what else is out there? So then I saw ultras and I saw trail running and, and actually Dick, we had you doing yeah. some trail running up in Duluth as well. And, and you know that trail running is, first of all, much more forgiving. And boy, do you ever get right. strong. I mean, it's like cross country, cross country, getting ready for track. Uh, definitely the strength. And um, so I, I got into that and I started doing the 50Ks and I and I and I'd do all these different races. And then I started doing the, the hundreds. I did Western States and I did Leadville. 
And and that whole thing then said, what else, whatever else is out there too? Well, the Ironman was out there. So that was putting together a 2.4 mile swim, a 112 mile bike ride, and then go run a marathon. And I did uh, uh, two of the Ironmans over in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Ironman twice, not mm. Kona, did not go to Kona, but did both of those. And that was the genesis of what you see back up here, right there. Of, of transitioning. Uh, my mother also taught professionally and personally. She had, a, and I, her papers are amazing to, to see what literature she taught at Columbia. And she taught about the importance of reinvention. And, the, and her concept of reinvention was both personal and professional. You need to know when to reinvent yourself because otherwise you'll become stale and irrelevant in whatever it is that you're doing. And life is like learning when to reinvent yourself. And what I did is I reinvented myself from doing all this running into the triathlons and getting this biking that I'd not done that much before and then getting my first mountain bike and now doing what I'm, I'm doing at, at Leadville. You know, now, you know, 21 finishes and 18 silver buckles. And right back there, that picture is, uh, is first ever. Uh, fat bike to finish the Leadville Trail 100 in 2011. Everybody said it's impossible to do that. That's a 54 pound <laughs> salsa muckluck bike that I rode uh, to the finish. Did 11:28 at 12 hours is the cutoff for the Leadville Trail 100. That's 104 miles, all above 10,000 feet, and five death zones at uh, over 12,000 feet that you've got to ascend. And I did it on a fat bike, no suspension, no nothing, <laughs> and uh, and did that. And I'm now still uh, still pursuing that to be the first. And I'll and I'll probably I'm my my other guys uh, have decided to do something different than I do. They they've decided to wait to be 80. I'm going to keep on riding until I'm 80 because nobody's done uh, the Leadville Trail 100 at 80 years mm. old. And in a few years, I'll be 80 years old. And I'm going to give her a hell of a run. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a hell. I bet money hey, on and it. Bill, we'll, I, we'll I want to back it. up just a little bit because you know. Sure. As you started getting, you know, looking for something beyond the marathon, you got into this ultra marathon. You started one of the most prestigious ultra marathon races in the country, in the world, the Edmund Fitzgerald 100K. And you were the, I think you hosted the first world championship ever in the United States for 100 kilometers. Tell us how that got, how you got involved in that, because it was an amazing race. Dick. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, and, and the genesis of that was that Barney and Janice Klecker yep. came to one of the ALARC board meetings. And Barney was a very, very accomplished much. ultra, very much so. And Janice, of course, 1991 Barcelona Olympian, number one uh, on our women's team for the marathon. Janice, a doctor of dentistry. You know, we both know them both very, very well. Just incredible people. And Barney just came and he said, he said, Bill, I, I, I want to, I want a hundred kilometer road race up on the North shore. You're the guy to do it. Do build that for me. And I said, I said, obviously I said, okay, let me think yeah. about this. Okay. Well, long story made short. I, 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 I took the, the wonderful ship, the Edmund Fitzgerald and put that together, put a 50 K and a hundred K together. The, and, but, but it was a running race that, that, he that Barney wanted me to, to create and the first year that we had the 100k so we've started in Finland Minnesota point to point through all the back country all the way down to um what do we call that uh the the hill in lemon drop marathon lemon what drop call that? Yeah, lemon drop it finished on oh, lemon wow. drop it finished on lemon drop hill so after all that and the first year that I put it all together and you think of all the jurisdictions and the organization and all the counties and all of the things that have to happen. I can just tell you, it is a big, big thing to do. I had 12 people show up and I'm going, okay, wait a minute, 12 times 25 times. Yeah. Okay. This is not going to work. And so that next year I created both the 50 K and the team right. relay and, and the team relay became huge, but it, what it allowed us to do is it allowed us to have the financial operation to support the fact that we'd have a venue for these world-class athletes. So in 1991, we were the USATF uh, Ultra Marathon Road Championship of the World, and we were the IAAF 
World Invitational. And on that year, 1991, Dick, thank you very much for remembering this. We are we are rated in New, in England, uh, where all the books are kept on ultra running. We're the third greatest ultra marathon ever, ever wow. in the world. The Edmund Fitz is the third greatest because on that year, the only athlete, man or woman, across the world that was were running ultras that did not come was Domingo Catalan from from France. He's the only one that couldn't make it. So we had Giannis Kouros. We had it was we a, had it was amazing. All, Oh, Dick, it was, it was stunning, stunning. And the race was incredible. That's the year that the German coach, because we had uh, donated, we had cars donated from Pontiac to help. And so all the foreign coaches got a car, but they, they had never driven a, a an automatic before. Cause in Germany, they're all, you right. know, I think I remember this manual. story. <laughs> remember? Well, he had a brand spanking new Bonneville, you know, uh, a Bonneville uh, car. And he was so excited about his German team doing so well, you know, his, his German runners that he pulled over, pulled off and forgot to put it in park and got out and went and take kick kicker of his, his athletes. He comes back and the Bonneville is in Lake Superior. <laughs> oh, my That's gosh. The, I kind of remember that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, and, and all I'm going, all I got to tell you is um, – uh, there were lots of things that we had to deal with as a race oh. director. You can imagine that, right? Oh, and there are many, many more stories to tell about oh. the Edward Fitzgerald that we don't have any time to talk about. But I can tell you, I had to hire one of those U-Haul things where right? you put the front tires up, you know, on it. And, and I'm taking this back to <laughs> Pontiac and Bloomington. Needless to say, they were no longer a sponsor <laughs> the next yeah. year. And all I was waiting for was the bill for an oh. eight thousand whatever dollars it was. Oh, at that time that's a great story. Great they let story. me go. Is, they oh, let that's me go. Classic. So, oh, there's so many. Th those those are so great. And let me just put one more. The other thing that I did there too is is we we really brought the community together. I, I found this out that it's a lot of people in the community really uh, gained a great deal of respect for the event because we really paid attention to the Edmund Fitzgerald right. itself, the ship that went down with 29 sailors. And there were family that were still in uh, Duluth. And we made it a point every year to invite them uh, over to the Duluth Convention Center to be a part of the ceremony. And one of the traditions, Dick, that you possibly remember is that uh, we had each of the sailors, we had a, a certificate, their picture and who they were, whether a boiler man or whatever. And we had people who would volunteer to go up and they would read that uh, person, the, the, the person who, who uh, died on the ship. And they, we, we had a great big bill, uh, bell that we searched the United States to find the ship's bell. I had it, right, we found it, we brought it. I had it built a great big uh, thing for it. And they would go up and ring the I bell remember that. each year for, for every one of those uh, people. And finally, for Captain Sorley uh, as well, and it was a celebration. The parents came, uh, the the families came, and then I heard so many stories from the ultra runners, the solos. They've never in the Edmund Fitz. You never had had anything like the Edmund Fitz because you had all these teams. Right, two hundred forty five, three hundred teams of eight people each. They were all along the course. They've never had that many spectators, and the and the actual recognition of these people doing that distance by themselves and they were doing it with eight people just garnered so many of the people watching to to say i want to do that we talk we're, we're talking about things how do you get inspired to do some of these things well this is one of the other ways that it's done and and what what, what would happen at the uh for the 100k is if you finished you got at the finishing at the at, at the awards program. You got to come up and ring the bell. That kept so many people, so many stories I could tell you about the runners, the solos that are no no names to us, but they said I kept coming because I wanted That's to ring the cool. bell. That's pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. It's, 
So oh, thanks, yeah. Dick, for asking about that too. Well, Bill, you know, <laughs> we're kind of getting late, and bringing that, bringing people, you know, the resume. I'm going to post it. I want people to read through it. You know, you in your accomplishments. President of the American Lung Association. You've served on the um, member of the Joint Commission of Accreditation for Healthcare. Let me tell you, I worked at a hospital my whole career. And when the Joint Commission came, people stood up and, and stood at attention and you wanted to have everything ready. And you're one of those guys that would come and, and check us out and make sure we were doing our job appropriately and the money was being spent appropriately. President of the National Association of Ambulatory Care. I mean, it goes on and on. Entrepreneur of the Year for the Twin Cities. Um, Founder of ALARC. Anyway, you're you're probably just kicking back now. Got your rocking chair out on the porch. I'm assuming you said you're 76. <laughs> well, you know, when you sold your business, I'm I'm thinking you did okay on that. I'm hoping you know you you made out on that all right. So you probably don't have to you know have to. You're not done though, are you? What? No. Bring us up to speed. No, I, I yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, thank you, Mike, so much. Uh, I commented to you when you asked me to do that. I, I said, you realize that you ask a resume of <laughs> someone that's 16 and you're going to get a different resume of someone who's 76. Mm. If you live long enough and, and your life is has any degree of purpose, uh, your resume is going to have a, a, a few lines of, uh, of things that should be recognized and and i'm i'm so honored to my lord and savior jesus christ that he allowed me to put quite a few lines together and one of those was also to be elected uh, for eight years uh, for our local minnetonka school board so i served on the school board as well here and uh had always brought the private sector concepts to what we were looking at versus the public sector so i had an interesting way of looking at a lot of different things and valuing education and as a part of all of that, they've just kept me coming back over the years uh, for everything uh, to say, hey, Doc, uh, you know, my nickname, Doc, from the from the Vietnam that the kids here picked up. And uh, they just said, you know, Doc, come and take a look at this and take a look at that and take a look at this. And and what do you think? And do this and take over that and all that kind of stuff. Well, about uh, seven now, almost eight years ago, uh, I was asked to come back uh, and take a full-time administrative position with Minnetonka High School. So I'm a non-academic administrator now with Minnetonka High School. And so my team comes in in the afternoon and what we do is we take over all the capital assets. So when my academic colleagues are done uh, with the educational program, we take over all of the valuable assets that um, are deployed primarily for support of our activities, all our sports activities, educational activities, but they also have value to other outside clients. So we take care of all of our sports teams. My team does. We take care of all the sports on the campus, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, ice hockey, whatever it might be, uh, lacrosse, uh, inside gymnasium, gymnastics, uh, wrestling, basketball, whatever it might be, volleyball. And then we have clients. And so I just had a client this last weekend that brought 500 people in here. They need space and they they rent the space. So we give back to the um, the local community. One of the things that was never kind of figured out because with the authority we have as a public institution, we can go and take tax dollars. So we can say, we're gonna tax you for the schools, mm -hmm. right? Well, you may or may not have anybody in school. So you're, the benefit <laughs> is sort of muted. And then we only used it. And that's what I, they, they knew. I talked about this on the school board. They, I said, we only use this for six hours and 24 minutes a day and 171 days out of the year. Well, if you're, if you're in a business owner and you have a capital right. investment like we have here, you don't want that sitting for hundred and the rest of the days, nor the rest of the hours. You want to make sure you got it working. So we make it work. We give back uh, the revenue from all of those, those clients that we have. Uh, to basically back to the, to the taxpayers. So hopefully we don't have to go back for referendums or other things to ask them for more money. We're making what they built us for one purpose used for other purposes to give back and say thank you in what another way. What a great way. idea that is. Have yeah. Is this a model for other, and, and, you know, are there and, other school districts that are actually kind of looking at? They, they are They are fascinated by Doc. My, my wonderful, I, I work for the AD and uh, and uh, the, very kind of, of them to say we they just had a statewide AD conference, and uh, and Ted said Doc and and Paul the assistant AD they said everybody talked about Doc, 
no no other school has doc you know our our basketball coach uh, price um and and Cosgriff uh, Brian Cosgriff both of which won the the state championships this year in women's and and men's basketball so we won the championship this year and Bryce was very kind to get up at their banquet and say I just got to say something I've been college coach I've been a high school coach I've been all over and I said I've just got to tell you there's only one doc there's only one doc there's never been another doc at any place I've ever been before and Brian Cosgriff was kind enough with the women's coach to say and the, and the kids and I just love being here I love being here because I'm around people that their their future is the next 15 right. minutes right <laughs> next 15 minutes and and I, I love being a veterans affairs coordinator here so I do all the veterans affairs programs here we've got a nationally recognized veterans day program that people can go up on um, on YouTube and just look it up, Minnetonka Veterans Day, and look at what we do to not forget. You guys do an amazing uh, job so, with that, Bill. I've seen some of the footage. It yeah. really is. There's nothing like it. It's nothing like it. Nothing. Thank you, Dick. It's nothing like it. You know, the flyovers that I just, a B-25 flyover, I've, I've got so many connections we did for for our, our recognition of service football game. Each year we'd have a football game for that. And let me just say quickly, just on that one, and why it's important to kind of do some, all of these things. I think it's good to, to do all of them. Just as a result of them, the, the Boosters Club, Football Boosters Club said, we'd like to do a celebration of service, Doc, uh, with one of our football games, like homecoming and senior night. We want to have this celebration of service. Uh, could you, what are you thinking? And I said, well, what do you want to do? And I've, I've got on doc, on doc coming, uh, on deck, I should say, coming, United States Marine Corps Silent Drill Squad. They promised me from Barracks One in Washington, D.C. that we're on the queue. It's hard to get them. Uh, I also have dove with the, the Golden Knights at Fort Knox. So I've dove with the Golden Parachute team there. And I've got them, the sergeant, uh, first sergeant, we've got them scheduled to come. But this last year, uh, they, they wanted to have something big. And I said, let's do a, let's do a fly or I can get you a B-25 and some <laughs> military two, or World War II fighter escorts, and let's do that. Let's do a low call, and let's bring it in tight. And uh, sure enough, did that. It was <laughs> unbelievable. And then I said, we, okay, now we need a field flag. So I said, let's buy a great – so I've got a great big American field flag that we pull out. Takes It, it takes about 45 of the kids, their parents, to – pull that bad boy out. So we do that deploying of that. I've got my Marine Corps, Army, Navy, Air Force, color guards all there. I got my honor guard and we have this great big flyover. Here comes this B-25. And you can only imagine for a moment in World War II thinking that there are six to 800 of these flying over Europe at one time when they come. We had one bird, one bird and two fighter escorts. And those Thunderbirds, you could hear them wow. coming. You're from giving Casket, me okay. You're giving me shivers <laughs> down my spine just thinking about it. Well, Bill, and, and they flew. Everybody's flying over. Well, here I'll, I'll close to the crescendo. I can I could tell stories forever. <laughs> in fact, they they do they do believe that the, all my friends believe Doc's going to end up in a wheelchair, uh, a rocking chair, rocking chair outside the coffee shop in Leadville, and everybody's going to ask who is that, and that's Doc. Go ask him to tell you a story. <laughs> And put a quarter in the uh, cup. And, and by the time you drive to Denver and get on your airplane and you're flying home, he's still telling the story in Leadville. You know. So anyway, but what we had, the booster cub came back to me and said, Doc, we got to come meet with you. And I said, sure, come on over. Come on over to my office. They said, as a result of what you, you put together, somebody in the stands had some connection, could be a Blue Star family, could be a Gold Star family. Dick, you know that with yeah. your son, your Gold Star father. Um, somebody, something, gave a six-figure donation, anonymous, wow. that said, don't stop doing that. Don't stop doing that. Keep on That's doing awesome. that. And the kids come in here I'm with the Travis Minion Foundation that I'm, I'm the – the admin for them to help them out. And we sit here and we talk what, what they want to do. And he, of course, was famous by, if not me, then who? And he died in, in, in action in, in Iraq. But if not me, then who is going to go do what we need to do? And the kids, I had one of the young men sit across the table and we're just having a nice chat back and forth. And, 
And he said, Doc, you should teach history. And I said, son, I am. <laughs> yeah, there you go. absolutely. Bill, thank you oh, so Bill, much. You know, on a personal level, thank you for no. your friendship. <laughs> You've always been just that kind of guy that you could call anytime you take the call, you'll spend whatever amount of time. And thank you for taking the time out of your day. You're a busy guy. And so Dick and I sure appreciate it. Oh, absolutely, Bill. And oh, and yeah. we'll have to do this again because, you know, we, we, yeah. there's so many things we didn't even yeah. get to cover today. Yeah. And, and you're just the best. And we, we appreciate everything. I appreciate everything you've done for me over the 40 some years that we've known each other. And 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 for all the things you do for Minnesota, your community where you live in Minnetonka. I mean, you, you've you've been an inspiration and, and helped so many people over the years. And, and we want to just thank everybody, too, for listening today. And if you have any questions for us or comments about our show, you can contact us directly on our website at beardsanddunpod.com. Or you can leave us a comment on our Facebook, Instagram, or X, all at Beards and Dunn Pod. And if you're watching on YouTube, uh, hey, get a comment. Hey, I'll tell you guys. That, Go ahead. Yeah, and then don't forget Christmas at Beardsley's Farm, the year that you had your oh, accident. That's that, a great story. Okay, that's a we great will story. have to get together because that was an ama- That story <laughs> itself was amazing. All right. Chopping yep. down the trees. Hey, Dick, we got All a lot right, of Take care, have guys. Have a great day. Yep, bye-bye.